So what are FADs? Most of you know, but the biggest thing that they present the challenge on is trade limitations. Because once we get any of these things, essentially any and all trade for exports is done. And so really what we're looking at is a couple different groups. Some of the vesicular diseases like foot and mouth disease, swine vesicular disease, and then other things that are more systemic like classical swine fever and African swine fever. And these are really considered diseases that are not in the U.S., have either haven't been in the U.S. or have been eradicated in the U.S. Um, some people argue that PED was initially, I'm not going to get into that discussion because that could take a whole other day. But at least these are the main diseases that we've been looking at and are worried about consistently. So the commonalities with these things, again, none of these have been in the United States for quite some time. Foot and mouth obviously is a big concern because it doesn't just affect swine. It affects any cattle, sheep, goats. So it causes a lot more problems in a whole range of ag industry other than just in the swine sector. On the flip side, classical swine fever, African swine fever, and swine vesicular disease only affect swine. So if those get here, that's basically an industry problem. The good news is these really are not a threat to public safety or food safety, and that always comes up because when people are looking at their food supply, and especially in the recent years, they really want to know, is our food safe? So that's one of the messaging that we're looking at because we know that these diseases don't cause a food safety issue. I'll bring up very briefly the look-alike issue of Seneca Valley virus. Um, I know you guys have had some, uh, some breaks of that, especially in sow units. It seems like we're seeing more cases ramping up in the Midwest recently and even at our state fair. Um, we've had pigs go home because of vesicular lesions. And I bring it up because before we had Seneca Valley, if you saw vesicles, that was a really an old crap moment. You had to call the states, the federal folks, to come in and to do an investigation. With the advent of Seneca Valley, it looks very much like foot and mouth because you'll see sore, lame pigs, you'll see lesions on the coronary bands, on the, the uh, nose and lips and tongue. And it's still really important to make sure that we follow through and do investigations on those because we can't go and assume that it's always going to be Seneca Valley. And so that's some of the word that we're also getting out into the show sector and other places that just because we're having this virus doesn't mean we should ever let our guard down. So now on to the pictures. Um, so basically what we're looking at from a vesicular standpoint is, well, you can't really see it in these pictures. There's a little vesicle on the nose of a pig. These pigs, he can see, is kind of squealing. They're very lame. They're very, they don't want to be on their feet because their coronary bands are inflamed. There's another little vesicle on that pig's uh, snout. And then you can see some erosions up in here of the coronary bands. And that's very, very typical with any vesicular disease, including uh, Seneca Valley. So African swine fever and classical swine fever, that's a more of a systemic disease. So you'll see things like a lot of hemorrhage. This is African swine fever, so the organs have got a lot of blood when you open them up. Um, and so they're pretty, pretty telling that something is not normal. Classical swine fever is a little bit more subtle. You'll see potentially some uh, purpling of the ears. You can see gant pigs, um, diarrhea, a little bit of an enlarged spleen. When I went to FAD school back in 2010, what I saw on the floor basically reminded me a lot of other things that we see in production, whether it's erysipelas for sore pigs, whether it's salmonella for purple ears, or even enlarged spleen. So the take home is, even though we see a lot of diseases that can look like foreign animal diseases, if the presentation is different, there's an increased morbidity um, and even mortality, uh, that should trigger an alert of, hey, maybe this isn't what it seems to be. And so we also have to thank our diagnostic labs. They're starting to be able to do more work on these foreign animal diseases as a general screening, and that's something that we're continuing to push USDA to allow our, a lot of our diagnostic labs to do. So impacts, like I said, basically shut down trade. Um, so right now about a little more than 25% of meat products that we produce here in the United States go overseas as exports. And so we've had a little bit of struggle with that with China and Russia, but it's a, a pretty big chunk of our production does not stay in the U.S. The moment a foreign animal disease is identified, that whole export market goes away and we better be prepared to consume that 25% of exports in addition to what we already have in the U.S. So it's a significant issue and one of great concern. So what are the threats? Well, we've got people, I think this is a 
folks that are coming in from, from PETA and other organizations, would they knowingly infect or bring over things into our industry for sabotage? To date, I don't know of any of those events that have happened, but it is a possibility. And the more and more radical people get, the more and more that may come up to the front and become an idea. And so sometimes FBI gets involved in certain cases to make sure that there wasn't anything shady going on. A bigger one is really export or imports of illegal products. This is uh, information, Patrick went to Miami, and this is just one day's catch for uh, the quarantine protection services from USDA. So when they stop people at customs, that's literally just one afternoon or one day's of confiscation. And so people bring in ethnic sausages or things that they make in their, on their own homes. And so if they're doing that in countries like Dominican Republic, in Latvia or Poland and bring that to the US, that somehow gets into the food supply or even closer to production in swine, now you have a setup for being able to very, very nicely transmit a foreign animal disease. And so that's something we're very, very concerned about. Um, African swine fever in Russia, or actually in Georgia, was thought to have come over from um, visiting UN soldiers when they brought their own foods with them. And when, when they were in Georgia, had left the scraps and garbage, local pigs came around, ingested that, and then all of a sudden the ASF circle started. And so it's very, very plausible to happen. And lastly, we've got another sector, basically our garbage feeders. And so there's still folks in the U.S. and several different states that are allowed to feed garbage, whether that comes from cruise ships, from casinos, from whatever. And so they do have guidelines and they do have inspections that have to happen. But just like everything else, um, there's less money to do more with. And so we may not get out to these sites and inspect them as often as we'd like, or there may be some things that the temperatures aren't quite as right. So that's still another area of concern, is what happens with these garbage feeders and how do we mitigate that risk. So impact. I'm not an economist, Ron's here, so if you've got economy <laughs> questions, ask him. But um, there was some studies that were done back in uh, 2002. Now this is just for foot and mouth disease, but about $14 billion if that disease gets into the United States. And that was at that time and really assessing what it would look like for the swine industry. But as I said, FMD affects other ruminants, so it's not just us that would be affected. By the same authors, they also assessed classical swine fever. And so that was a range between 2.6 to $4.1 billion. Again, from lost export sales, from uh, loss of animals, if we had to use vaccine, and then depending on how long our quarantine time was before we could get back to shipping at export. So it's still a pretty hefty number. Um, that study was back in 2009. So additional work out of the Center for uh, Ag and Rural Development, uh, Dermot Hayes did a study a little bit more recently and was looking at impact of FMD. And you can see the impact on all of the different species and also our grains and feedstuffs because there's a, a secondary effect. Obviously, if we don't have the animal species to eat the corn, the wheat, the soy, that's going to have a negative impact on that industry as well. And so those are, again, some very rough estimates, but needless to say, there's a pretty significant impact if we should ever get one of these diseases in the U.S. Same for classical swine fever. Again, that's a pork-specific or swine-specific, but $51 billion, it's still a huge deal, and as you amortize that over 10 years. So what do we do from an industry perspective? Um, and this is Dr. Patrick Webb's little analogy. They want to make sure we can ship them. So we look at different things like how do we have preparedness and plans in place, both with ourselves and with our industry and government. Um, how does surveillance fit into this? Do we do surveillance? How should we do that? When, et cetera. Looking at pre-harvest traceability, which is premises IDs, biosecurity, uh, research, et cetera. So those are a lot of the areas that we're focused in on a national level. And so emergency preparation. Um, Dr. Webb has really worked very hard on a lot of these different areas. And obviously you can see some of the goals are really to detect and contain the disease. That's first and foremost. Um, we'd love to be able to detect it within you know, two weeks' time or less. Obviously our experiences with PED showed us that may or may not be realistic. Um, I think with PED, by the time it was all said and done, there had been at least a month's time elapsed from the true first index case to when everybody really got geared up for it. So that's a little bit concerning. Um, we also have to seek strategies to stabilize animal ag. 
So that means getting out messages that food is safe, that people can still consume products that have, you know, that are safe to eat even in the face of an outbreak. Like I said, we're going to have 25% more um, pork on the market when we ever get an FAD. And so we've got to have messaging out there to make sure that people are still willing to eat pork, to eat ribs, and make sure we can have disappearance. Another one is to facilitate continuity of business, and I've got some things we'll talk about on that side. But again, how do you make sure that people remain viable in the face of an outbreak, and not just immediately in producers, but all of our other secondary industries, such as truck washers, transportation, feed and feed and grains, so all those different things. This is just a listing of a lot of different plans that are out there for foreign animal diseases. So a lot of these are uh, developed in concert with the industry, most of them are done by USDA because they're the ones that are the primary people that would respond and manage the disease. But with that said, we want to make sure from an industry standpoint that whatever comes up with is something that's, you know, we're able to do it as an industry without having the plan kill the industry itself. So those are things that we're working on. Some of the specific things, um, the FAD crisis communications, our communications group have a plan, not just with the swine industry, but with sheep, goat, dairy, uh, beef, cattle, basically to say what's our joint and collective messaging in the event that we have an FAD. So there's a website right now that's dormant, but as soon as if the word ever comes out that we've got FAD somewhere in ag, that website becomes active, there's messaging that goes out, there's resources that goes out. We've got a whole list of experts prepared and ready to talk about a disease. And so you wouldn't think about that, but that's something that we do exercise routinely to make sure that we're not, again, behind the eight ball. Um, secure pork is something I'll talk about real quick later. It's, that's part of a business continuity plan. Again, to try to make sure that if there's any chance we can do some exports on a regional basis, that's the route we want to go. So those are just an overview of some plans. Um, again, coordinated effort, none of this is done in a vacuum. And so all of these different organizations really are involved and involved heavily in a response for an FAD and also involved in the planning. Obviously, the non diagnostic labs, so that's the National Animal Health Laboratory Network. Iowa State's a part of that. North Carolina's a part of that. Pretty much anybody that does routine diagnostics is a part of a standardized diagnostic system for USDA and is able to do a lot of things. But state associations, allied industries, pharmaceutical, really it takes all of us to be able to manage each aspect in the event of an outbreak. So what else are we doing? Um, earlier when we had PED, we asked USDA to go through and do a feed assessment, really more for enteric diseases, but the first one kind of didn't go there. So what USDA looked at is what is the risk of importing a disease from another country, whether it be through feed totes, um, feed ingredients itself. And so USDA is working on a comprehensive assessment. Their models were using classical swine fever, foot and mouth, and pseudorabies virus. And so what the long story short, <coughs> excuse me, um, they came through and said that it was a relative negligible risk of introduction of those products. Um, we're still trying to get the final report to, to really see what all of the analysis and detail was. So we said, okay, that's nice, but what about for these enteric diseases that we know there is a certain component for feeds and feed products? And so that was also instituted, uh, I think, towards the tail end of 14 and beginning of 15. And so uh, that study is underway. Also, another study is looking at specific feed totes. What is the risk of importing feed and feed totes to U.S. producers, to feed mills? And so that study is also underway as we speak. Um, so hopefully we'll have more information from that and the potential risks. But having this risk analysis can help us understand where do we need to target funds to try to answer some of these questions and also address policy issues. Because even if we can't, from a pork board, maybe NPPC from a policy standpoint can work with FDA on increased surveillance or testing or even preventing some of these uh, risky materials from coming into the U.S. Same thing we're doing, um, USDA is undertaking a study for ASF. There's more and more of that now um, out in the, the sphere, a lot more activity than there was in 2011 and prior. And so 
this is being done in conjunction with the University of Minnesota, and they're trying to assess what are the risks of ASF coming into the country. So looking at some of the feed and garbage products, looking at geographic locations and hotspots in relation to a lot of other traffic in the U.S. So that just got instituted in June, and we look forward to that, that uh, description as well. So other things that we've done... From a port board perspective, we have sponsored different trips overseas to assess and address what are some of these diseases. So I took a group in 2011 um, to, excuse me, <coughs> AS, uh, Russia to go look at ASF. And so we visited with a lot of their diagnostic labs. We visited with producer associations. We visited with the, the federal veterinarians and said, what are you guys facing? What are your challenges? How are you dealing with it? And how can we deal with it better if it ever gets to the United States? And so we had folks from Diagnostic Labs. We had folks from the, the USDA lab in, in Plum Island in New York. Um, Liz from NPPC, uh, Dan Rock, and Gene Erickson. Um, so a lot of these guys were coming out just to help assess what are the critical needs for ASF. 2013 in China, there was a group, I think Harry was part of that, um, went out to go look and see what's going on in China. What are some of the things that are happening there that could present risks to the U.S.? You know, little did we know at that time with PED was going to be such an issue, but uh, there was a lot of things going on and people wanted to investigate that. And then, let's see, 2015, just recently, again, we had another group go over to Poland and Latvia, again, to assess ASF. And this farm was actually one of the first ones that broke with ASF, and uh, they actually had to, I think, euthanize about 19,000 animals out of that site. And so those guys talked about their experiences with control and elimination of ASF. So research, that's another big component um, that we use checkoff funds for. And so, for example, for foot and mouth disease, I mean, we'll look at things like vaccine. Even though vaccine development is very costly, at least we can help support some of the research that's going on at Plum Island to help develop tools for producers. A lot of times when FMD vaccines are developed, they get shoved more to the cattle side, so we make sure that we can balance it and have it specific to swine. Um, there's some therapeutic things that are being looked at, and then also looking at the epidemiology. What are transport risks? How does our current movement system in the United States present a risk for the transmission of FMD once it got into the U.S.? If we know what the transmission risks are, then we can come up with strategies to potentially mitigate those risks. So that's, those are things that we're doing broadly for FMD. Classical swine fever, again, same thing. Looking at current diagnostics, um, I think 2010 we looked at vaccines for CSF as well. There are current products out there, so vaccine development wasn't as high a priority, but at least having accurate diagnostics um, using some contemporary samples is really what we were focused on. Same thing with African swine fever. Um, there's no current vaccine right now, and so it's a very difficult pathogen to deal with. And so what we've been trying to focus on is, is there a certain gene in that virus structure that is conserved, and that way we could use a vaccine for it. So we've been looking at that, um, looking at different vaccine prototypes, adjuvants, carriers, do they even make an impact or not? And then also looking at some specific oral fluid tests, um, because a lot of people are using those now. They're a heck of a lot easier than drawing blood. But we want to make sure that the, the tests that we use here in the States can cover a lot of the other viruses that are out there. So we've partnered up with some folks in Russia who have a pretty large uh, bank of viruses. I think it's over 320. That way we can cross-compare the, the value of our tests. And so general looking at animal welfare implications because of movement restrictions. If we had to shut down today, what does that mean for welfare on our farms? And how does that play into in with animal restrictions? Um, again, diagnostic standardization is a big deal, so we've been working a lot with USDA on these things. Uh, and then also looking at disinfections. That's kind of a no-brainer, but that's some things that we have funded. So we also have now had a center, the Swine Health Information Center. Dr. Turner is sitting on that board. Um, but really what they're doing is supplementing some of the work for foreign animal diseases. They're not looking at FADs, but they're also going out and looking at what's, what else is out there that could come into the U.S. and could present a problem and trying to set up an infrastructure to be able to deal with that. The funding came from Pork Board, but it is a separate entity completely. Um, and they're looking at diagnostics, epi, so they're looking at things like Seneca Valley virus. Um, they, if PED had come up when the Swine Health Information Center was up 
two years ago, they would have been overseeing that. And so, again, they're looking more at emerging diseases or other things that may be here in the U.S. that are changing in incidence, um, but they're not really looking at current diseases or foreign animal diseases. They're funded at about $5 million for five years, and our boss, Paul Sundberg, is actually now the executive director of that center, so we'll be working closely with him. So what else are we doing? Doing a lot of educational information just to inform producers, vets, um, what these diseases look like. Because unless you've been to Plum Island or been overseas consulting, you probably haven't seen these. And so we've got a new thing called a push pack that Dr. Webb has put together. And so that's information that you can hang on walls and send out. I didn't bring any with me because it's a pretty big pack. But it's got a lot of good information and 8 by 10 color glossy photos and all that fun stuff. Um, we've got an ASF report and fact sheets for foreign animal diseases. And so here's some examples of that. And so it's information that's all free. People can just call a uh, pork board and we can get that out to you. <coughs> Excuse me. But it is designed to help supplement people when they're looking at foreign animal diseases and biosecurity. So speaking of biosecurity, there's other things that we've got out there that, again, we try to make sure that people understand disease transmission in general. Um, you know, it's, I have this one on the fairs and shows because we're really into that season right now. And a lot of people just don't really have an understanding of how diseases can transmit. So the more we can put information out to help all sectors of the industry understand that fact, I think we'll all be better off. So that's something that we also have available for people. So ID and surveillance, that's another big one, because if you can't identify it, you can't manage it. And really what the whole task is, is to look at our swine ID. And I know here in North Carolina, you guys are set very well having premises identification. There's still other sectors that are working on that. But the goal is to have a breeding herd pin that you can follow all the animals all the way through to the packer site. So if there is somewhere, you know, we find vesicles on a pig at a packer, you can trace that back to the farm, identify where in the system that, that was identified, and shut down those appropriate sectors, and also let people know what's going on. And so that's why we keep pushing premises identification, because if you don't know where a lot of these pigs came from or their location, that's a big deal. I know from our poultry counterparts in uh, Iowa and Minnesota have had a hell of a time with this because a lot of those sites when they were dealing with avian influenza do not or did not have premises identification. A lot of them do now um, and at a lot of great cost. So that was one of the things that really has hampered some of their disease response is not having a lot of these sites identified ahead of time and having that to put on their diagnostic sheets. And so there's nothing like scrambling to do something right in the middle of an outbreak versus being prepared ahead of time. So this is just an example of sow IDs and sow tags. And so this is something that uh, we've had a push from our packers as well as making sure those are mandatory. So having the USDA approved uh, sow tags that have the, the USDA shield uh, both on the, the button and the main ear tag, again, for identification and trace back of cull sows and boars. So that all fits in with the surveillance and ID. So this is a concept we're still working on overall really good surveillance in the U.S., but the intention is to be able to take these pins and make sure that whenever we're sending any information from any of these sectors into a diagnostic lab, there's traceability with having a solid pin there. I know the diagnostic labs appreciate that as well because, again, if they find something, it's a whole lot easier to trace it back if you have a solid pin versus not. Um, PED, for example, if you submit samples for PED, those all had to have a pin or you didn't get reimbursed for the information. And so right now, none of that information has been released. That was a big question on confidentiality. But it really is helpful to have that information ahead of time because if you know something's out there, it completes the circle in trying to respond a lot more quickly and effectively. So same thing, you know, we, we look at the industry, there's obviously pigs really much throughout the whole U.S., but concentrations here in the southeast and in Midwest. And so having identification, having it tracked on our certificates, and I don't have a picture of an e-certificate, those are becoming more popular. But again, the more that we can know about the sites and things that are submitted, the animal movements, the better we can respond down the road. And so that leads us to business continuity. Um, this is a program called the Secure Pork Supply Plan. And that is a plan that uh, Iowa State, the Center for Food Safety and Public Health, has been working on, Jim Roth. 
And they've got a, uh, been working with USDA to come up with a plan that says, how can we compartmentalize a disease? So if we got foot and mouth disease and it happened in you know, a small county in Minnesota, but it's not expanded anywhere else, how can we just say, okay, we've compartmentalized that area in Minnesota, they may not be able to ship things, export, but everybody else can. And so that's really what this plan is about. And so we're looking at how do you set up identification beforehand? Do you have a standardized set of biosecurity plans? Is there standardized disease surveillance and information sharing? And so they have been working. I, some of you guys have, may have been tapped in to assess the programs or to look at it. It's still under development. It's not, not being implemented yet. But it creates standards for diagnostics, for biosecurity, kind of for the chain of command of who gets uh, called and when in a foreign animal disease outbreak. And so this was in place for eggs when IPATH came in. And so they use this as an example um, for the secure egg supply of how they did their testing, biosecurity. And when they had that, that allowed people to ship eggs or poultry inside a control zone or a hot zone, even though that farm itself was not affected. And so that's kind of what our intention is for secure pork. And so you can see there's all the different zones in here. So if you're in an infected zone, there is an opportunity that if you're part of secure pork supply, you are testing, you have good biosecurity, you don't have disease, you can ship. Same thing with the control, surveillance, and other areas. And so kind of how that would work, um, you've got all these different finishers. Each of them are in different zones, the control zone and the uh, surveillance zone. So if the state vet can determine, are you part of secure pork? Do you have a valid traceable premises identification system? Do you have your biosecurity in place? And do you have surveillance? If everything is good, then now you can ship. And so that makes a big difference because now you're not stopped in movements. And so you don't come up against these welfare issues of, well, I can't move pigs. And so that's the value of the secure pork supply. So it's kind of going to be one of those you, you um, volunteered to be in it. Um, and that way, the more and more people are a part of this, the intent is to make sure, again, we can do this for the United States and have better chances to export. I will say that not all countries have necessarily said we'll accept this and embrace it, and that is work underway. We've had some experience now with Secure Egg and Secure Turkey, but hopefully some of our other trading partners will recognize the value of this and accept it and also deal with that, that compartmentalization. And so just again, some more, more things. And so there's just some additional information. We have done piloting of this project. Uh, any of you that know Craig Rolls out of Elite Pork, he went to the dark side and poultry, but before he did, um, he actually did a secure pork supply uh, um, run, test run, and Paul Thomas was involved in that too. And so they shared data, they shared surveillance, the state vet was in on it, Dave Schmidt, and so kind of went through all of this to go through the motions of would this work in a state? Our next plan is to go multi-state, so we may have Ohio and Iowa in on it together, or Ohio, Ohio, Illinois, and Iowa. That way we can see things, how they move between states, how do you do with multiple veterinarians, multiple sites. So these are all things that are still in process. So if you haven't heard about it, you haven't seen it yet, don't worry. It's not, in, it's not a policy yet or anything like that. It's still, still being demoed. And so you can see... Um, some of the information, they'll look at how can they move pigs outside of a control zone area. This is a, a click of a screen of Ag Connect out of Texas A&M. They've got a dashboard system that can collect in information of, of diagnostics, biosecurity information, and they can basically come up with these movement maps and say, you can move here or there or other places. So it's just one way you can visualize what's going on. I also know BioPortal is, is doing something very similar. So all of this is kind of happening now, but I think in another year or so, we're really going to have some pretty exciting tools to track movement of pigs, to track sites, to track eligibility. And I think, if nothing else, it's really going to strengthen our industry and our ability to export and keep, keep markets open. So in summary, um, 
I know it's a lot of stuff to cover, but global trade is still a really big deal for us as an industry, and we need to make sure that we're prepared and can support that. And so that's why a lot of these activities are really, really kind of high on our priority schedule and, and high on our funding level. Um, global trade's not going to cease, and global traffic's definitely not going to cease. Um, I, you know, it was interesting. I came back from Chicago a couple weeks ago in a PERS meeting, and I think there was maybe five or ten of us that looked to be Americans, and the rest were not. And so there's a lot of people coming into the states, and so that is of concern. Not everybody's going to do it, and it may be unintentional, but there's a lot of traffic. Um, we need to have a robust system that can ID and pair up diagnostics and surveillance information, and not just by shuffling papers, because that's just not efficient. Um, we got to try to get all this information into a, uh, an Ag Connect or a BioPortal system again to make us more efficient and accurate when we're trying to diagnose these things. And then from our standpoint, research is still really needed um, because a lot of the things that we're doing for research for foreign animal disease can only be done at one location, either here in the U.S. at Plum Island or overseas. And neither of those are really cheap affairs. And so until we have other options for looking at some of these foreign animal diseases, the cost of doing research is really high. Um, and right now, USDA's budget for research keeps getting squeezed. So we're really right now trying to, to keep the ship afloat as far as these diagnostics and, and vaccine development. And so that's about the 30,000 foot view.